This week, we have the climatic clash between General Braxton Bragg and his hodgepodge of rebel forces, which struggle with General William S. Ruskrans, Midwestern Army of the Cumberland. It's mind-boggling how long these two armies have gone without a battle. The prime spring and summer months of 1863 went without the forces facing off. General Ruskrans has attempted to win his part of the war by outmaneuvering Bragg, which he has done successfully. Without any bit of overstatement, moving the rebel army of Tennessee from its namesake state was a massive victory for the Union that first to break the Confederate economy, logistics, and morale. If Bragg wants to save his position, he has to act. And so he does. Braxton Bragg delivers his orders on the night of the 17th and the morning of the 18th. He has a multitude of divisions without any concrete structure to ensure order. The primary target of the Army of Tennessee is Lee and Gordon's Mill, where General Crittenden, commander of the 21st Corps, a supporter of General Ruskrans, is deployed. Crittenden holds a formidable position and, if taken head-on, would result in a massacre of Bragg's force. Instead, the Army of Tennessee is ordered to cross over Chickamauga Creek using multiple fords. Before we move to the execution of these orders, I wish to share a quote from General Braxton Bragg to his commanders. All movements will be executed with the utmost promptness, vigor, and persistence. This is an important note because it shows General Bragg's lack of trust in his commanders. In the lead up to the Battle of Chickamauga, on multiple occasions, the men under him have refused to obey his orders, and he is unwilling to let any deviation from his orders. Then we will cross the fords and move on the left flank of the Union Army of the Cumberland. Rose Kranz realizes that he needs time. His army is split up with him and two of his corps being away from Crittenden's position. And while it's strong with breastworks being thrown up, its flanks are weak. Ruskrans dispatches two mounted brigades to hold those flanks. Colonel Robert H.G. Minty takes his regiments from the cavalry and occupies the northernmost left flank at Reed's Bridge. Then the famous, then the famous Lightning Brigade, Ruskrans' favored brigade, equipped with the latest technology and running top condition, is sent to hold the southern Alexander Bridge. On the morning of the 18th, the orders to attack were followed by the Army of Tennessee. There was a lot of confusion among the rebel forces, and they were behind schedule even before they come into contact with the Union. General Bushrod Johnson leads his division in their crossing of Reed's Bridge. He comes into contact with Colonel Minty's cavalry. This surprises Johnson, and the mere presence of the Federals slowed down the secessionist march. Minty can't hold forever, with General Nathan Bedford Force chasing him across the bridge and securing it. Without the Union being able to burn it down or destroy it. Colonel John T. Wilder and his Lightning Brigade can repulse at his bridge, the division of General Wilder, who suffers 105 casualties and is forced to move downstream. By 4.30, the of the rebels on Wilder's flanks force him to fall back. Also at 16.30 hours, General John Bell Hood arrives on the field and directs Bushrod Johnson to push further. But dark soon comes and forces the battle to halt. Johnson is opposite Wilder, rolls on Lafayette Road. Most of the rebels are far behind, with only a few brigades crossing the Chickamauga Creek. Both sides have reason to be happy. Bragg has created a beachhead over the Chickamauga, achieved some sort of surprise. Bruce Cranston, though, has more reason to celebrate. His delaying action worked, and the information he's gained supports his conclusion that Bragg is trying a flanking maneuver. He orders his second in command, General George H. Thomas, to take his 14th Corps and march to Crittenden's aid. From the 18th to the 19th, the men of Thomas moved quickly, moving to Crittenden and passing him, forming up on his flank. On the morning of the 19th, General Bragg expects to crash to the Union's left flank at Lee and Gordon's Mill, but the Army of the Cumberland's line is now forming up on Lafayette Road, parallel to Bragg's own, all the way up at Kelly's Fields. Divisions of General Reynolds, General Brandon, and General Byard are deployed in this forested rough ground, while General Negley and his division are further back. When General Thomas arrives, an officer gives him a report that our little brigade has crossed the creek and is vulnerable to assault. Such a prize is too tempting to be passed up. General Brandon's division is ordered to assault. The Federals charge General Forrest's dismounted cavalry. The horsemen are forced back and it is revealed that they aren't alone. They were straight in advance of General Walker's corps. Prince Infantry goes even further, pushing, pushing, against the brigade of General Ector. Ector's brigade is scared and sends word to General Forrest. I'm uneasy about my right flank. Tell General Ector that he need not bother about his right flank. I'll take care of it. General Ector then says a word about his left flank. Tell General Ector by God I am here and will take care of his left flank as well as his right flank. Forrest, eager to go on the offensive, his preferred way of war, mounts his horse and leads a charge against the Federal Division. 
and with reinforcements from Walker's Corps, he successfully pushes Brannon. The 14th Corps has numerous men, and General Thomas tells General Byard to support Brannon. They soon reach their bad brothers in arms. First General John King advances with his 1,270 Brigade of U.S. Regulars, deliver a terrifying volley into the advancing rebels, and force them back, with help from Battery H of the 5th Artillery. For three-fourths of a mile, the Southerners run through the woods, pursued by King's men. When, the brigade stops to dig in. The battery is brought onto a low ridge, and the 16th U.S. forms behind it. Just as they feel comfortable, General Liddell and his division charge their flanks, destroying the 16th, who escaped the onslaught with 67 of the initial 308 they started with. The division then takes the battery. The regular brigade begins to flee the battlefield. Just as it seems all hope is lost, the bugler of the 15th Infantry takes his sword and instrument and orders his men to halt and rally. The 18th Infantry's flag comes into view. He sounds to the color and rushes to the banner, starts his one-man vanguard. The rebels try to push into the breach, when the 9th Ohio, the German regiment of German orders and tactics, is ordered by their Colonel Kamerling to swing to their left and join with their brigade led by Colonel Van der Veer. God names. Brigade lies on the ground, allowing King's men to pass over them as the Army of Tennessee comes into sight. Then you were approaching in orderly array, ranks behind ranks, no skirmishers or preliminary firing, with the evident intention of forcing an actual collision. We opened on them at about 200 yards, with carefully directed file firing, while the battery treated them with canister and double doses. They made no reply, with splendid courage continued their steady advance. The ranks were soon so depleted, however, as to make it plain that they could not make a successful rush. At 50 yards, they began to wabble, commenced firing wildly. Presently, they started back in wild disorder. This is a unique way of battle. The train makes this what Wilder calls a soldier's battle. The action of this battle directed not from the officer's tent, but on the field of battle. This confusion, though, doesn't mean a general is useless. Ruskrantz hears the sounds of battle and gallops towards it. At 1300 hours, Old Rosie arrives at his HQ for the action, a small log house on the right flank. He looks over the battle from this cabin, letting General Thomas control the conflict's left half. There isn't much action in front of the HQ or Weir Glenn's house, the only news being the capture of one of Hood's men. The Army of Northern Virginia is here. That realization is followed by an assault from the Army of Tennessee. General Bragg ordered General A.P. Stewart, also known as Old Straight because of his teaching, to support Walker, who, according to the commanding officer, is cut up. Stuart stumbles his way through the forest, unable to find any of his fellow officers, and determines to just assault the first northern soldiers he can find. A mile away from Walker, he spots two Union brigades. He squashes the regiments brought to the division of Van Cleef. These names. After the initial actions of the day, Thomas desired reinforcements and spoke with General Crittenden, who was swayed, and ordered Van Cleef and Palmer to take their divisions and countercharge the rebels. Van Cleve lead regiments from the 79th Indiana and 17th Kentucky captured a rebel battery for securing the heavy guns when Stuart charged their flank. For an hour, the two sides fight, with the Union slowly giving ground. Old Strait, wanting to pursue his victory, crosses the Lafayette Road and sees Rusecrans HQ. He's about to take it when Negley Division arrives, ready to threaten him. Strait wants the high ground of the HQ. He needs to deal with Negley. Two of Negley's brigades are fresh and powerful, with one brigade led by Bergeron John Turchin, that name sounds very familiar, pushing on the rebels' flanks and breaks them. As Stuart falls back, he encounters veterans from the east. Hood's Texans have arrived, and as they march towards the battle, one of them calls to Stuart's men. Rob up Tennesseans and see the Texans go in. For 200 yards, the Texans proudly march before a volley from General Jefferson C. Davis breaks their line. Hood moves forward, trying to rally his men. Move up, men. Those fellows are shooting. Move up, men. Those fellows are shooting in the tops of the trees. The Royal Brigade turns on their left flank and advances against the ridge where Davis is firing from. Just as the Ford men reach Davis's line, they suffer canister and grape shot, which cuts holes in their line. The brigade is soon ordered to withdraw and run towards the reverse slope. The Union breaks line and charges down on them. But like Wellington at Waterloo, the reverse slope is a trap. Musket fire breaks apart the northern rank. The Union is driven back at the heavy cost of three Texan commanders dying. Hood himself is wounded and his horse seriously wounded. The Union is forced to flee over Lafayette Road and towards the Widow Glen. The Texans, so usually disciplined, fall without any order in the elation of their victory. The men are scattered in their pursuit. 
when Colonel Wilder of the Union takes his lightning brigade, unleashes constant fire from his repeating rifles, and unleashes 200 rounds of double shot by his own count. To make matters worse for General Hood, divisions of Wood and Sheridan arrive from the 21st and 20th Corps. Hood, leading Longstreet's corps, is forced to retreat. One of Stuart's men, looking at the fleeing Texans, raised his voice. Rob, up to the scenes and see the Texans come out. That's a nice dig, not appreciated by its recipients, but they can't do much. A third major assault by the Confederacy was held. General Claiborne is to spare the advance. He is a good choice. His 5,000 man division is well trained in the art of effective gunfire. 1800 hours, they burst out into action, and a firefight in the dark commences. In the twilight gloom and smoke, the two lines were entangled with each other, and friends could hardly be distinguished from foes. Rebel Brigade Commander Preston Smith rides to a regiment and asks who they are. A musket bullet responds that they are in fact Union. Claiborne won't let this loss set him back, having his heavy guns move to only 60 yards. After 30 minutes of receiving close-range cannon fire, the Union is forced to retreat. <laughs> Claiborne captures some guns, several hundred men, and two colors. It's too dark for Claiborne to continue the assault. The night of the 19th reveals the brutality of the day. Twice the rebels reach the Union's rear and are repulsed twice. J.H. Hill recalls the 19th as being the sparring of the amateur boxer, not the crushing blows of the trained puglist. The 19th was clear and cold. The cries of the wounded haunt the night. The male contingent of both armies are overwhelmed. The ambulance train workers light fires for the wounded to huddle by. It's hard work trying to heal people. An Alabama soldier builds a fire and recalls. Yet the men were gay and lovely. Full of hope and confident victory as ever. We all thought that we would whip the enemy. The night's work isn't done yet. At 2300 hours, General Rosecrans calls his corps commanders for a conference. Rosecrans uses these conferences to unwind and better understand his position. But on this day, the officers are depressed from the high losses. There is little joy in their successful holding of the line, the concentration of their forces. Thomas L. Crittenden is silent, usually a drinker and braggart, but he knows he's beyond his abilities here. Mr. McCook is one of the prominent fighting McCooks of Ohio. He was routed at Perryville and Stones River. Knows he is beyond his abilities. This leaves only Major General George Henry Thomas, the most respected and most trusted, to speak. Whenever I touched their flanks, they broke, General. They broke. What are we to do next? I was strengthening the left flank. Where are we going to take it from? There is no answer, and Thomas falls asleep. I spent the last two nights sleeplessly marching. Though he always wakes up to repeat, I would strengthen the left flank. In the end, Bruce Grant agrees, bringing his line to Thomas, having McCook's corps form on his right and keeping General Crittenden in reserve. Thus, at 2 a.m., General Thomas can finally sleep. He wobbles back to his sector. Instead of snoring, he hears the ringing of axes. His soldiers are improving their fortification, a fence rail, biting logs and clearing the fields before them with fire. The 14th Corps commander is proud of his men and patrols the line, watching them hard at work. Soon, General Byard reaches Thomas, informing him that his left flank is too weak to be defended. The tired Thomas, an old Virginian, facing off against Virginians, rides with his fellow Unionists to the left. It needs to be reinforced. Bruce Kranz receives a request to send General Negley to the far left flank. It will be done at dawn. Thus, George Henry Thomas is allowed to pass out under a tree. Then there is the camp of the Army of Tennessee. General Braxton Bragg has faith in his men. They are masters of the ground, whatever that means. In addition, there is General Longstreet, who is due to arrive momentarily with two veteran brigades. The prisoners Bragg took report that he is facing the entire army of the Cumberland, and just like Bruce Kranz, counts of war is held. Bragg's subordinates don't like him. Only General Hood writes to him warmly. According to my custom in Virginia under General Lee. There, the Army of Tennessee is directed for its actions the next day. To turn the enemy's left, and by direct attack, force him into Micklemore's Cove. To accomplish this, the rebel army gets a new command structure that would hopefully simplify its organization. General Lee and I spoke with control of the right and assault at dawn, attacking from right to left. General James Longstreet takes the left wing and will support it. It is important to know that this commander, Braxton Bragg barely knows, is given 50% of his army. Upon hearing of Polk's battle, Longstreet would join in. General Polk, wishing to return to comfort, moves his HQ to a cozy farmhouse, though he does leave a chain of pickets and couriers to redirect his subordinates to the new farmhouse. This works well for Walker, who meets with Polk in person and receives his orders. Now the courier sent to Daniel H. Hill gets lost and spends four hours running around a forest. Hill moves to find Braxton Bragg, reaching his headquarters, but guess what? Braxton Bragg isn't there, having relocated his camp. 
Returning to his base, a random staff officer informs Hill that Poke is now his commander, and to see him, Hill collapses in anger and naps for three hours. 2300 hours, General Longstreet finally finds the camp. No escort or guide was given to him, and in his confused wanderings, the old war horse was almost captured by a Union picket. General Longstreet, instead of getting sleep, inspects his ranks, which are unfamiliar to him, besides the five brigades he brought from the Army of Northern Virginia, examines the terrain, which is also new to him. General Bragg awakes to brief Longstreet and hand him a crude map. As the day of the 20th arrives, the adequate Union defenses go up against the overall sound rebel plan, which only suffers from insubordination on the right wing. The question of Chickamauga is sadly up in the air. Sunday morning, dawn, Lieutenant General D.H. Hill is speaking with his two divisional commanders, Breckenridge and Claiborne. A courier writes him, and as Hill reaches for the order, the courier explains that the letter are only for the divisional leaders. Lieutenant General Command and having sought in vain, while Lieutenant General Hill gives you the directive of the fallen orders. Look upon the task enemy so soon as you are in position. Major General Chief the on our left has been ordered to make a simultaneous attack. Hill takes this as an insult, which it is, and sends the courier to Polk to inform the commanding general that the assault must be delayed. The men haven't eaten and their lines aren't up to order. So when General Braxton Bragg wakes up and leaves his tent and hears nothing, the assault is delayed. How many battles is that now? Five? With reports of the Union felling trees and strengthening its position, Bragg feels the need to attack now. He is right. Reports show that from daylight to contact, they reinforced their fortifications for a long time. Both sides wait. But the Army of Tennessee's commander can't wait forever. Sends a staff officer to Polk to figure out what is so damn crucial that his orders weren't followed. The answer isn't satisfactory. Then Bragg utters a terrible oath, whatever that means, and demands that the assault commence now. The staff would direct every single captain to advance. At 0930 hours, the assault begins, late, disjointed, and doomed to fail. On Thomas's far left flank is the regular brigade of John King. You remember them from the morning of the first day? Well, he sends the 1st Battalion of the 18th Infantry to occupy the far end of a field. Though, King remains worried about his position. Soon the brigade of Bird General John Betty comes into view. Where is the rest of General Nagley's division? By the time Nagley received his order, the rebels were massing in his front, making him unable to maneuver his division. Betty moves on to King's left flank and meets with Breckenridge's infantry. Breckenridge has very little knowledge of the terrain. Where the enemy is, and of the battle, having only skirmished lightly yesterday. He has 3,769 men, three brigades, who come into contact with mostly air. Only General Helm and his Orphan Brigade, brigade orphaned from its home state of Kentucky, engaged fully with the Union. The advance across a clear against the regulars and are flanked by the 29th Indiana, who unleashed volleys at ranges of 100 to 250 yards. This musketry decimates the ranks of the rebels, who do make it to the breastworks of the Union, even planting a standard on it, but are repulsed. General Helm is mortally wounded. The 2nd Kentucky loses their colonel, and the 4th Kentucky is injured. The officers of the orphans were able to reform the brigade, but upon their second charge are broken again. While the orphans are broken, the rest of Breckenridge's brigade is able to utterly destroy General Brady's brigade, which capture many men and take two cannons. The Confederates accidentally cut off the Union's ability to escape north and extend to the Union's rear. Now evident from the comparatively slight resistance they had encountered and the fact that they were not running in front, that might not extend beyond the enemy's left. At once ordered these brigades to charge France. At once ordered these brigades to change front, to advance upon the flank of the enemy. This advance upon the flanks, combined with the sight of the fleeing men of Betty, unnerves King's men, who, after serious escalated fire, begin to fold. But the bugler from yesterday, here reformed King's men, once again saves the day. Oh crap, I forgot to name him. Carson picks up a musket and holds it as provost marshal, steadying the retreat. General Absalom Byard, a divisional commander, brings up his second line. The second line is a hodgepodge of regiments and brigades, which makes it difficult for them to maneuver. To salvage the situation, Byard writes to two regiments and orders them to charge. With a cheer, they advance. As they march, Colonel Stanley from Negley's division moves forward from the south, ready to flank Breckenridge and snare him in a vice. Bell turns against the rebels, with one of the brigade commanders, General Stovall, remembering it as... A concentrated fire of grape and canister shot and shell of every conceivable character was poured into it. To get out this concentrated fire, it forces the rebels to move forward. They were cut down en masse. Then, fire from the south. It isn't Colonel Stanley, but Colonel Van Der Veer. His brigade was ordered ahead by General Thomas to support Bayard. After two excellent volleys, Van Der Veer charges Breckenridge, which collapsed Stovall's line just as Stanley and reformed men of Betty break the remaining brigade of Breckenridge under General Adams. In the confusion of the battle, Adams is captured. After an hour, Breckenridge 
fell back, his assault repulsed, and Thomas's left flank safe for now. After Brigadier began his attack, Hill gave the word to Claiborne to assault. With three brigades, the division faced off against eight brigades by breastworks. This charge is doomed to fail. Virginal Lucius Polk, the nephew of the more famous Polk, reported his part of the assault. My line from right to left soon became furiously engaged, sending me pull on the most destructive pop canister musketry to my advancing line. So terrible indeed that my line could not advance in the face of it, but find down the fight for another hour and one half. The other two brigades of Claiborne, Dashford and Woods, struck further left, but it was a doomed assault as they entered a clearing 200 to 500 yards away from their target, which was behind breastworks. The Union's fire on both small arms and cannons holds the advance of Claiborne's division at a safe distance. The other two brigades of Claiborne, Desclare and Woods, struck further left. It was a doomed assault as they entered a clearing of 200 to 500 yards away from their target, which was behind breastwork. The Union's fire both small arms and cannons holds the advance of Claiborne's division at a safe distance, forcing the rebels to hit the ground and slowly pick them off. Claiborne, who normally understates his reports as opposed to the more popular overstatement, went as far to call it the heaviest I ever heard. After one hour, the division withdrew, having lost 1,300 men in an assault that never reached the Union's battleworks. So his success was holding down three divisions of the Union, R.W. Johnson's, Reynolds, and Palmer's. The moment has come for Hill to fall back, but he refuses, instead going to General Walker's reserve corps to demand a brigade. Not just any brigade, but States' Rights Gist Brigade. I have no idea why this brigade. Maybe he hasn't seen combat the day before, but only numbers 980 men and hasn't seen much action at all. The commander is in States Rights Gist. He's brought only a moment before the request came in, instead being led by a lowly Colonel Peyton Colquitt. His charge fell spectacularly, missing the Union's line, being hit on the flanks, losing its commanders and field officers, and being forced from the field, leaving one third of the brigade on it. The action on General Thomas's extreme left and center caused the shuffling of forces from his right flank, creating a gap between the 14th Corps and the rest of the Army of the Cumberland. There were actions by General Wood to fill this gap, but it isn't perfect. General James Longstreet soon receives word of this gap, and he is very different than Polk. He speaks with his commanders directly, even holding a lengthy conversation with Hood, a fellow man from the Army of Northern Virginia. The men of the East, always sure of victory, were thankful to find the other in high spirits. We will, of course, whip and drop him from the field. Longstreet was the first time I had met with my rival who talked to victory. Instead of the traditional battle line of the Army of Tennessee, Longstreet forms his 17 brigades into a cob that we used to smack his way through the Union's line. He hears the sound of battle, which is his sign to attack all the way back at 9.30. Well after he should have. This confused him, which is understandable. He takes the initiative and sends word to Bragg, asking to assault without having to wait for Polk to fully engage. Bragg's staffers showing no initiative don't respond to him, instead fulfilling their orders to direct every captain to attack, which undoes the column by having the right flank's division of General Stewart begin to march which forces Longstreet to quickly order his column forward, lest it assault piecemeal. Ten minutes between Stuart getting the order and Longstreet, sending his men forward spell disaster for Stuart. The reserve brigade being sent to the meat grinder got confused and was shredded to sunder. One brigade flanked and repulsed with 30% casualties, another breaking the enemy's first line before being devastated by cannon fire. Longstreet is able to reach the gap he saw earlier. This gap was a monumental failure. General Thomas requested more reinforcements for his left flank, forcing his line to shuffle the brigades to fill the gap. To do so is complicated, and many brigades get tangled up. Lewis Trans blames this on General Wood. By your damn negligence, you're endangering the safety of the entire army, and by God, I will not tolerate it. Move your division at once, as I have instructed, or the consequences will not be pleasant for yourself. So when the order comes into Woods from Lewis Trans to fill a gap that doesn't exist, Wood creates a gap and marches to Thomas to save Nagley's flank, which Thomas tells him doesn't need saving, instead he should move to General Byard's flank. So what does Longstreet charge? A breastwork manned by one brigade, Protecting Van Cleve's division, two of Sheridan's brigade, two of Wood's brigades, and one of Davis's brigades. The nearest support is Colonel John T. Water, quite some distance away. Though Colonel Wellbot is mid movement and very close, Longstreet's assault cuts through the exposing line like a hot blade through butter. Joe McNair faces no opposition on the right flank, advances almost a mile before Union artillery wounds him and a colonel, but a senior colonel orders a charge to continue the assault. Another of General Bushrod Johnson's brigade, led by Colonel Fulton, engages with the 100th Illinois, captures the regiment's colonel and many companies. The slight delay allows the reserve brigade of Johnson's division and men of Hill's division, now led by General Law, to catch up and become intermingled. 
This destruction of order doesn't stop the charge of the rebels, who move through the brush of trees towards the batteries that stopped McNair, from Bushra Johnson's recollection. The resolute and impetus charge, the rush of our heavy calm sweeping out from the shadows and gloom of the forest into the open fields flowed with sunlight, the good of arms, I want dash of artillery mounted men, the retreat of the foe, the shouts of the hosts of our army, the dust, the smoke, the noise of firearms, of whistling balls and grave shot, the bursting shells, made up a battle scene of unsurpassed grandeur. Your General Hood gave me the last order I received from him on the field. Go ahead and keep ahead of everything. The Union infantry has broken and ran. This is even worse than it sounds, because in the regiment's eagerness to flee, they have obscured the sight of a grand battery. At the Battle of Stones River, the work of a single man saved the day. That man being John Mendenhall. He assembled a grand battery that broke the rebels' assault and solidified the line. Here at Chickamauga, he does it again. He forms on Missionary Ridge 26 guns from five batteries that steady the position. It's not perfect. They have no infantry support, and as I said earlier, their view is obscured. But once the rebels reach range, cancer shot cuts down entire ranks of men. The battery cannot stand alone as it did at Stones River, with 15 pieces being lost and the rest fleeing. But it bought time, and demoralized the chargers from their drug-like high they exhibited during the charge. Thus the rebels could not quickly exploit their victory, allowing Colonel John T. Wilder to join the battle and stabilize Union position with the help of the 21st Michigan. The 98th Illinois, the lead regiment of Wilder, is able to use its force to recapture a battery. This brings it into conflict with men of Manigault. But the Union, soon reinforced by the 39th Indiana, also armed with Spencers, pushes the rebels back. The rest of the Lightning Brigade appears, and soon their battery is firing shots and shells into the enemy. With that, the mounted infantry charges into Manigault and breaks them. General Hinman had done an excellent job in the aftermath of Mendenhall's battery, hitting over one mile of territory and breaking General Sheridan's division. It was too good. There was confusion now of where the rebel line was, leaving the 15th Alabama to open fire onto Hinman's rear. This froze the division. It soon became clear that Hinman was all alone, open to flanking fire, which soon arrived from Colonel Wilder. Hinman begins to withdraw under fire from Wilder, being utterly confused by who is firing from him and where. But he has done his job because his breakthrough has brought the battle to Roosecrans. Bruce Krantz at his HQ has very little knowledge of the rebel breakthrough. He's looking over two brigades marching towards Thomas when it stops. A native Bruce Krantz spoke. I'm going to give him away yonder. Bruce Krantz responds, this is impossible. But as he looks that way, he sees the aide spoke the truth. The brigades he watched hurry to Thomas. One makes it, the other doesn't. Under Confederate fire, that brigade hits the ground. But in the insanity of battle, Union caissons crush soldiers alive. Bruce Krantz is watching the disintegration of his army as McCook reports that Lillabot's brigade is moving to charge the enemy. Then, the breakthrough against Mendenhall dawns on Bruce Krantz as southern regiments approach him, and the army of the Cumberland's commander realizes the full extent of the breakthrough. <sighs> Charles Dana, the Assistant Secretary of War, watches the commanding general flee the field, and the headquarters disappear. Bruce Krantz spoke to his men. If you care to live any longer, get away from here! This leaves the battle to the Corps commanders. McCook has his officers attempt to rally the 20th. He grabs a flag and rides amongst the cannon shells and mini balls, trying to reform a line. But his men won't listen to him. Other officers go to Bruce Krantz directly, but he's of no help. I believe I've done all I can. General Crittenden is similar to Bruce Krantz in spirit. All lines were unusually short, and as soon as one line was out of ammunition, another was rushed forward. His officers suggest he go to Chattanooga, and like that, he rides away from the battle. McCook soon follows. This meant that Roosecrans, two corps commanders, and four divisional commanders all independently left the field of battle. This left General Thomas in the 14th Corps against the entire Army of Tennessee. While Union's right wing was falling, Union's left wing remained primarily intact. The Army of Northern Virginia is having a hard time in the battle. General Hood's division is halted and receives hard fire from General Brandon's division. The rebels advance and engage in a heavy firefight. All lines were unusually short, and as soon as one line was out of ammunition, another was rushed forward. This holds two brigades, but the third bypassed the Union line and its commander, Burgeon Jerome Robertson, attempts to flank the Union, but struck head on by a volley and soon countercharged. Not under 25th Ohio volunteers under Colonel Oak Dyke were able to force any back. This regiment is untested and has everything to prove. Under fire, they do a complete change of front and duel with Hood. Just as they settle in for a long range trial of gunfire, General Wood, their brigade commander, orders them to charge. This is suicidal. A great regiment charging an elite brigade. But they do so, and it works. The Texans break, bleeding themselves outnumbered and flanked. They retire from the field and decide to let someone else do the dangerous deed. General Benning's brigade of Georgians is also broken, and Longstreet has to speak to him 
for the commander to return to battle. Bow now turns to the north, with one third of the Union whipped and almost all the Confederacy exhausted. If Longstreet wishes to carry the entire field, he must do a 90 degree wheel to Thomas's position while under fire from Missionary Ridge. The rebels, at this time, are requiring Mendenhall's artillery position, which they foolishly let fall back into the hands of the Federals. The old war horse of Virginia writes to General Braxton Bragg to report to him and discuss further action. Longstreet found Bragg away from the battle, never a good thing, and when explaining how the battle plan was changed and why, Bragg is clearly angered. When Longstreet asks for General Polk's wing, Bragg shows no interest. In the Missionary Ridge, General Roosecrans and the Chief of Staff, Garfield, speak to each other. Roosecrans wants to join Thomas in the final defense and have Garfield write to Chattanooga, but Garfield disagrees. I can go to General Thomas and report the situation to you much better than I can give orders. With that, Garfield writes to Thomas and Roosecrans, exhausted, reaches Chattanooga, too tired to get off his horse alone. 1400 hours, September 20th, the Battle of Chickamauga is silent. The lull of conflict gives pleasant moments of peace to Thomas. His lens bends back in a familiar shape, naming the terrain Horseshoe Ridge. This ridge is on high ground that stands over a boulder-infested forested ravine. The sun sets in four hours, and as nighttime assaults are usually a bad idea, only four hours and thirty minutes remain a battle, which I shall cover in real time. I'm joking. For now. Familiar faces run parallel to the Longstreet's line. The 82nd Indiana under Colonel Morton Hunter steadied the line with the Colonel loudly declaring, I will not retreat another inch. This rallies more men, with fragmented remnants joining him, with some officers having no men to command, pick up rifles of fallen comrades and participate in this last stand. In the end, 1,500 men form with Hunter to give Thomas more time. Though I don't want you to think all Federal soldiers were of high honor and valor, General Sirwell is a brigade commander under General Negley. He's ordered to send the 21st and 74th Ohio, Sirwell marching with the 74th Ohio. When he returns, he finds his brigade is gone. Negley grabs him and retreats, leaving only the 21st Ohio. This regiment alone is still a threat. 539 men armed with the five-shot Colt revolving rifle, these elites know their strength and take up a position overlooking a ravine. The rifles soon lose ammunition as they fire very quickly. They try to resupply, but Negley took with him the supply trains? Therefore, the 21st has to search the dead and wounded for ammo. In desperation, they repulse a final charge, with it reaching a mere 20 yards from them. This brave stand helps Thomas, who is in a desperate state, but remains calm. Immediately to our right, set on a large bay horse, a general officer, who was utterly alone. Thunder battle swept along the front. Everywhere lines, everywhere lines were wavering and crumbling like ropes of sand. But in all, he was unmoved. Colonel rode up to him, and, Colonel rode up to him to ask, "How goes the battle?" "Very well, very well, sir. Move your line forward." Chief of Staff Garfield soon arrives and informs Thomas of the destruction of the other corps. The Union Virginia informs Garfield. We have repulsed every attack so far and can hold our ground if the meat can be kept from our rear. The rebels have reformed their line and are ready to assault the horseshoe. Rebel Manigault's brigade is the spearhead that has utterly broken off the Union's line. In the first three minutes, 300 men drop. They reform and are able to engage with the Union's remnant. The shouts of of officers, the screams of shot and shouts, the cries of the wounded and the groans of the dying men, the yells and cheering of friend and foe were all blended in one noise. They were thus hanging between hope and fear. A cry was raised. Help is coming. Granger's Corps is coming. So far, I have said that Roosecrans has three corps, the 14th, 20th, and 21st. But he technically has four. General Gordon Granger's Reserve Corps. Granger has been out of the picture for the day, having last heard of the Battle of Chickamauga last night. Since the breakthrough around noon, anxiety has gripped his heart as he watches Thomas stand alone. His chief of staff reminds him that if he acts without orders, he could be demoted or court-martialed. Don't you see? Bragg is piling his whole army on Thomas. I am going to his assistance. With that, Granger orders Virginal Steedman to take his division, move to Snodgrass Hill, and support the 14th Corps. Thomas writes to Granger, if the order stands. Does the order stand? This order happens simultaneously when Confederate soldiers under General Hinman and Johnson take the hill. Yes, there are raw troops, and they don't know any better than to charge up there. Union regiments advance under canister shot. One colonel dies, another hides a hundred yards away, and things are not looking well for the raw soldiers. Then, just as the 115th Illinois wavers, General Stephen runs to their colonel, orders them to halt. The colonel refuses and is sent to the rear. Stephen will personally lead this regiment. He grabs the flag and advances from the front. His horse is shot out from under him, so he continues by foot. Against all likelihood, they recapture the hill. It's 4 p.m. Longstreet is down to his last reserves. 
the final assault begins. General Polk has arrived to assist Longstreet since forward his nephew's brigade to charge the regular brigade of General King. But this goes terribly for the rebels, who regroup after bringing up artillery are able to take the position. The rebels try to distract the Union's right wing to flank its left, but this is held at bay even as the Union infantry are down to their last cartridges. Thomas, under this pressure, decides to withdraw. Having Reynolds removed first, the rebels won't have it and charge. Thus, Brigadier General Turchin takes his brigade, does a 180 turn, charges the oncoming Confederates, breaking them and securing the flank. With that, a brigade is left behind to support the retreat. August Willich is given the fateful deed. The brigade holds for a while, but as they see their comrades fall back, Willich can't stop them from running. With no rear guard, the rebels are able to deliver casualties freely, as the retreat of any army usually brings more deaths than the battle. The 21st Ohio does not fall back, it is being forgotten. The men continue to hold out until they are surprised by General Trigg's Mississippi Brigade. Men broke, some escaping, and those who couldn't destroy their guns so they wouldn't fall into the enemy's hands. The brigade lost 265 men out of the 500 they started with, 116 being taken prisoner right then and there. Rebels break the Union line quickly, and before nightfall, the two wings of the Army of Tennessee meet at Snodgrass Hill, begin their cheers of victory, celebrating their taking of the field. Longstreet wrote of the occasion. The Army of Tennessee knew how to enjoy its first grand victory. To the soldiers, it's their triumph. To their commander, it's nothing. Bragg doesn't seem to think he won. When General Polk tells him of the victory at midnight, Bragg just doesn't believe him. When he wakes up on the 21st and sees the enemy has fled, he doesn't pursue. His army has significantly suffered for Chickamauga, so on ammunition, food, and can't follow. When he meets Longstreet, he gets into a serious disagreement. The success of the Army of Northern Virginia comes from its aggressive tactics, and here's a golden opportunity to take back Chattanooga. Bragg could cut north and sever his communication and force a withdrawal, or he could assault it directly and push out the broken men of Roosecrans. Instead, he doesn't either. He advances on Chattanooga, but doesn't bring on a battle. Their soldiers are not as cautious as Bragg. We have whipped the Yankees badly. This is the only battle that I've ever fought and that we have held the battlefield. It does me good to march across it. Northwood. Though the victory wasn't cheap, the Army of Tennessee suffered 18,454 casualties, to the Union's 16,170. This isn't good for the rebels, since they don't have the manpower of the Union, so when a brigade takes 51% losses like General Bates did, it's unable to quickly replace them. What is to happen afterward? Well, I'll let D.H. Hill explain my theory. Seems to me that the lawn of the southern soldier was never seen after Chickamauga. He fought stoutly to the last, but after Chickamauga, with the sullenness of despair and without the enthusiasm of hope, that barren victory sealed the fate of the Confederacy. With that, the battle ends. It is sometimes reported by less knowing publications that Chickamauga means River of Death in the Cherokee or Chickasaw language. It isn't. But it has earned that name this week. The battle is second only to Gettysburg in casualties. Unlike Gettysburg, not much is done. The tide of war does shift, but Roosevelt was trying to move to Chattanooga before this battle. Bragg had done nothing. The same situation would have been had. Actually, let me go further. What has Bragg gained? Morale? Some might point to the rebels' morale boost and the Federals' morale loss. As we can't have a vote of the soldiers before and after, it's impossible to prove. But I will say this is likely true. What did it cost? Over 18,000 men, the loss of Knoxville, and the weakening of the Army of Northern Virginia. It's customary for me to feel down or panicked after a Union loss, but at Chickamauga, I don't worry in the slightest. The rules can have this victory, but at this high cost, they can't buy another. I, I feel like I'm missing something. Wait, what about Sickles? Uh, he is on his way to the Capitol to testify about his service at Gettysburg. Along his way, he stops. You know what? This isn't the week for this.